بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brother Yusuf was kind enough to allow me to give a guest lecture in the Sira series. So I asked him if I could do a uh, lecture talking about the geography and history of Arabia as it leads up to the life of the Prophet وسلم, and his life and times. So I've entitled this presentation, Arabia, the setting of the Sira, because every good story has a setting and there's no better story than the story of our Prophet وسلم, which is entirely within the Arabian desert. There's a hadith of the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, where the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that indeed Allah has chosen Ismail from the children of Ibrahim he chose Benu Kinana from the children of Ismail. He chose the Quraysh from Benu Kinana. And he chose Benu Hashim from Quraysh. And he chose me from Benu Hashim. So this is how the Arabs layered their identities. The identities of the Arabs were not just, I am from this tribe or you're from that tribe. No, the tribes are layered in which they look like this. So this is how... Benu Hashim would see themselves. All the people of Hashim, which is a sub-tribe of Quraysh, uh, all the people of Hashim are in Quraysh. You could do the same chart with Beni Umayyah, which would come up later in history, which is the tribe of Abu Sufyan عن, and his son Muawiyah عن, and Uthman عن, are from Beni Umayyah. Beni Umayyah and Benu Hashim connect after three or four generations. So they're actually very, very close. They're like second cousins to another. So their chart would look just like this. That it's Beni Umayyah, then Quraysh, then Kinana, and then Adnan. And uh, Brother Yusuf talked about Adnan, and we'll talk more about him later as we go through the presentation. But Adnan, Arabs, essentially the descendants of Ismail, alayhi salam. So Kinana is the big group that encompasses not just Quraysh, but many other tribes. Uh, mostly centered around the Hijaz. Um, Quraysh is almost entirely in Mecca, and Ben Hashim, of course, is the, the family of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, based on his uh, great grandfather. So, if you zoom backwards in history, about 4,000 years ago, before Ibrahim, السلام, after the flood of Nuh, we have a giant question mark of when these civilizations actually existed. Um, but we have their ruins, and they're mentioned in the Qur'an quite extensively. And that is the civilizations of Ad and Thamud. So these are the prophets Hud and Saleh. So Ad has Hud alayhi salam, and Thamud had Saleh alayhi salam. And this is roughly 4,000 years ago. There's a difference of opinion on if these are before or after Ibrahim alayhi salam. I think it's more strong that they're before Ibrahim alayhi salam. Um, but their ruins are in existence to today. 
On the left, you'll see uh, what's called Madain Saleh. This is a town uh, with ruins in Saudi Arabia today. And it's um, in the Al Ula region. And uh, what you see on the right is one of the potential locations of Ad, which is there's a difference of opinion on where it was located. This is the ruins in what is now Jordan. The place called Wadi Ram is a place uh, in Jordan. Um, so these are examples of some of the ruins that you'll find. Yes. So, 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 uh, the location where the prophet likes Hud, Hud, yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll get to that, inshallah. So, Ad is, um, and you know, throughout this presentation, there's a lot of sources on history, and I wanted to weave this story together using the prophetic sources of the Quran and the Sunnah as much as possible. History can, um, often be an exercise in just how much excess information can you acquire about people that have no consequence. But really, the, the reason to learn this history is to connect it to our Prophet ﷺ. Because if you love somebody, you want to know their backstory. And this is the backstory of our Prophet ﷺ. Ad and Thamud were known among the Arabs, which is why they're mentioned so much in the Qur'an. Um, and these are some of the verses that deal with Ad. Uh, these were this was a giant civilization and they were disobedient towards Allah and they rejected Hud. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them with a wind. Uh, and it's their fate is similar to Thamud. Um, I think there's universal consensus that that Thamud is after Ad um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that they succeeded them um, and mentions uh, that Thamud, now we're talking about Thamud, this is the civilization of Saleh alayhi salam, they were the ones known for carving their homes and their buildings into giant rock faces. And all of the tourism in Al Ula right now features pictures from what is known as Madain Saleh, the city of Saleh. Um, what happened with them is that Saleh came with clear signs, uh, which was a miraculous birth of a she camel, uh, in which case the people didn't take it seriously, they killed the camel. Uh, after which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them with an earthquake or a sound wave. Um, just a giant catastrophe destroyed all of them within their homes, and the ruins are still there to today. So this is another great photo of some of the um, the Thamudic civilization. Um, and there are many uh, rock faces like this with this design. This is not to be confused with Petra. So Petra is uh, a bit further north and is part of the Nabataean civilization, which is much later. So the Nabataeans are around the time of, of Isa, they said, um, about 2,000 years ago. The, the Nabataeans were a very big civilization, and they were also carving things into rock. But it was much further north uh, in what is now Jordan. And this is uh, specifically Thamud. Um, so there was a slight overlap of their territories, but the Nabataeans are very different than uh, the civilization of Thamud. So during the Battle of Tabuk, which is towards the end of the Sirah, uh, the army of Rasulullah وسلم, actually passed through this area in Madain Saleh. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after they had fed their camels, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, informed them that, this, that these wells are cursed. So to simply throw out the water that you have gotten from these wells and to not drink from them. Um, to basically throw away the water and to move on. This is in general, you, you shouldn't visit places of adab. You know, no Muslim should be trying to visit the ruins of the Titanic, for example. This is a lot like that. This is um, a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed an entire people with a vicious punishment. And uh, we should be aware of that. So even visiting, you know, Al Ula, there are some nice places. Um, but, you know, when you go to Saudi Arabia, visit Mecca and Medina, inshallah. There are two potential locations for the uh, location of Ad. And I'm fairly convinced of the second one I'll mention. The first one is a classical opinion that is the first one I heard 
when I became Muslim, this is the first one I heard. This is all in the classical tafsir. That Aad is around Hadramaut, which is in Yemen. So coastal Yemen, in the kind of in the middle of the peninsula. Um, so here's here's actually the dot. And this is a building that many ulama think is the grave of Hud alayhi salam. However, there are graves of prophets, alleged graves of prophets, all over um, the Middle East. So in Jordan, for example, there's an alleged prophet of Shu'ayb, or alleged grave of Shu'ayb alayhi salam. In Iraq, there's a couple. These things are not conclusive knowledge. We know exactly where our prophet وسلم, is buried but the other prophets we don't have exact certainty of where they were buried we can maybe make a good guess um where musa salam, is buried or where ibrahim salam, is buried but we don't know where Hud salam, is buried but it's possible that he is buried here um this doesn't mean that he would have to be from this location because he did leave ad uh, after his destruction presumably what I think is the more likely uh, place is the Wadi Rum area in Jordan, which is on the right here. And this seems to be more of an archaeological opinion, a modern one, a modern archaeological opinion. Um, and there's several inscriptions that are really interesting. One of them mentions the word Imad, so pillars. And one of them mentions the name Hud, like it was a common name in the area. So, you know, Allah Alam, we don't know for certain, but it is very interesting. Um, and... I can get you the source if you're interested in uh, more on this. There's no way to really talk about the Arabian Peninsula or our Prophet وسلم, without going back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Really, Ibrahim alayhi salam is the prophet to mark the beginning of recorded human civilization. There wasn't much recorded human civilization before 4,000 years ago, which is when the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam came upon the scene. So by this time, there were established civilizations all across the world. And the Prophet Ibrahim salam, was from a civilization called Mesopotamia, which we didn't know a lot about until recent archaeological investigations of the area. All of these locations are actually recently discovered, the ones I'll mention here. Um, Ibrahim salam, is from a place called Ur, which is south of uh, what is Babylon or Baghdad area, and is you know, at the tip of the, um, the Persian Gulf, or the Arabian Gulf, as the Arabs would call it. Um, the Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, he's from this area of Mesopotamia. All of Mesopotamia was steeped in idolatry already 4,000 years ago. They worshipped a trinity of the sun, the moon, and the stars, which is why in the Quran, Ibrahim السلام, is refuting worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is archaeologically absolutely correct. They worshipped Venus, actually, as the star that they worshipped. Um, this matches with history exactly. I mean, there's no major uh, problems. If you look at the Quran and the Hadith and actual archaeology, there's no big conflicts at all, uh, which is really amazing. It's another proof that what our Prophet Muhammad them was receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, this... Uh, archaeological site on the left is actually called the House of Abraham. And it's likely that Ibrahim salam, lived in something like this, uh, that it was a communal house in a wealthy part of the city uh, with many rooms, as you can see. Um, they nicknamed it that. It's likely not exactly where he lived, but Allahu Alam, it could be. Uh, and this is what's called, on the upper right, is called the Ziggurat of Ur, which is, a, it's kind of like a pyramid, but not really. Um, it's a big temple complex. They would do rituals on top of that. This place was willing to spend a lot of money on idolatry and, and paganism, which is why he was so extreme in opposing it. And really to understand where the prophets after him come from, you have to understand his relationship with his sons. Ibrahim salam, has two wives mentioned in our sources, and that is Hajar and, and Sarah. From Hajar alayhi salam, both the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews, we all believe that Hajar alayhi salam gave birth to Ismail first. So Ismail was the firstborn uh, son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. His wife from before, Hajar, Hajar was either a maidservant or like a gift to him or was married to him. We don't, we don't have a clear answer. 
uh, as far as I know, but he was likely married. Sarah uh, was a righteous woman, and then later she was barren, and then after is Ismail was born, she gave birth to Ishaq. In the biblical sources, he also has a third wife, where he has a whole bunch of other uh, people that come from him much later. But if you look at this, the uh, Ismail السلام, is the father of the Adnani Arabs. So the Arabs that are becoming Arab, the Arab al Musta'riba that Yusuf mentioned, these are the Arabized Arabs, these are coming from the north. They are from Ismail. And then the other side of Ibrahim's progeny is the Bani Israel. And we'll talk more about the Bani Israel and how they're related. So Hajar and Ismail, this is roughly 4,000 years ago. Hajar is from Egypt. She's either a maid servant or wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam after he visits Egypt. By the way, this journey of his is from a Bible um, uh, explanation of his journey. The Muslims would add another line to this journey that he would have left and gone straight down to Arabia and then back up. By the way, if you're interested, if you have Christian friends, the story of Zamzam is mentioned in the Bible. So Hadr salam, it's mentioned very clearly. It's not called Zamzam, and it's not called Mecca, but her finding water in the desert with a young boy is there. So Ismail is the firstborn son of Ibrahim salam. She is sent to the desert, and she is not expelled. The Quran is silent on the reason of why she is, uh, why she is uh, put in the desert with her son. The people who read the Bible, the Jews and the Christians, they will say that there is potential conflict between either the sons uh, or between the wives. And this is something we don't have to comment on. But if you're interested, there's a recent book that came out called Abraham Fulfilled, which is written by three Muslim authors. I got a copy here. It's over there uh, for the masjid. And it's, it talks about this and debunks the story from the biblical text. So the story in the Bible is very clearly redacted and it's out of order. And so Ismail السلام, in the Bible story, uh, it says that Hajar threw him over her shoulder, for example, basically flung him like you would a baby. But it also says that he's like a teenager at this point. So there are many details in the biblical narrative that don't make any sense. And the Islamic narrative clarifies much of this. So she is in Mecca with her son uh, Ismail. Uh, Ismail becomes a prophet. Ibrahim السلام, would go back and forth between Canaan, or what is now Palestine, and Mecca. Uh, he did not abandon his family. There was no bad vibes. Um, this was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was planning. The burial location of Ibrahim is allegedly in Hebron, Palestine. Um, the locals will say for sure that it's, that it's Ibrahim um, And the burial location of Ismail and Hajar are unknown. Um, likely in Mecca somewhere. Uh, this is from Tafsir ibn Kathir, uh, that ibn Abbas, عن, he narrated that Ibrahim السلام, made them sit over there. He pointed at the Kaaba and placed near them a leather bag containing some dates, some, uh, a small water skin containing some water. And he set, set, home, uh, set out homeward. Ismail's mother followed. So Hajr السلام, said, Ya Ibrahim, where are you going, leaving us in this valley where there is no person whose company we may enjoy, nor is there anything to enjoy? She repeated that to him many times, but he did not look back at her. Then she asked him, has Allah ordered you to do this? He said, yes. And she said, then he will not neglect us. And, he re and she returned, while Ibrahim proceeded onwards. So the story of Zemzem happens between then and, and this event. The, um, she runs back and forth between Safa and Marwa, trying to look for people or water, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously uh, you know, shows her a zamzam. Zamzam starts bumbling up, which is there until this day. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam would construct the Kaaba with Ismail alayhi salam. And there's, this is mentioned in the Quran several times. And he makes a dua when he's constructing the Kaaba. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Rabbana, 
Our Lord, raise among them a messenger who will recite to them your revelations, teach them the book in wisdom, and purify them. Indeed, you alone are the Almighty, Almighty all wise. And our Prophet وسلم, is a direct answer to this dua. The Kaaba, most people don't know, they think it's actually a cube, but it's not a cube. The, what you see there um, is called the, the hijr, which is that little, that, um, that circle part, the half circle. That is technically inside the Kaaba. So when the Kaaba was originally built, it was like a rectangle. And this is facing uh, north-south. So I, I moved the picture to show you how it would look like if you're looking north-south. Uh, this is the Yemeni corner, and this would be the black stone is over here. Um, the reason it's short is because during the rebuilding of the Kaaba, when Rasulullah was uh, young, they didn't have enough material to go all the way. So they stopped it short, and then they put pillars here so people wouldn't do tawaf, because your tawaf um, is not valid if it goes inside the Hijr area. Um, but if you get to go inside the Hijr area and pray, it's like you're fulfilling the sunnah of praying inside the Kaaba, technically. So that's something to know. Another thing about this is, you know, this is still here in Mecca, and that's the Maqam Ibrahim. And this is a platform. Some say that it floated up and down when they were building the Kaaba with the original stones. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to it as ayat, like a mir miraculous sign. And it's still there today. It is worn out because of people touching it. Um, but it's amazing that we still have this. I mean, to think that for 4,000 years, we still have this. And it also proves that the people in Quraysh at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu and then they knew they were from Ibrahim. They have artifacts from him. And this is still here. It's enclosed in this, uh, this metal enclosure uh, on the side of the door. So if you go back here, it's, it's right there. Oh, you see my mouse? Right there is the Maqam Ibrahim. Another thing I'll mention as an aside is the construction of Masjid al-Aqsa. Um, people often confuse this and they turn this into a political thing or they don't quite understand it. Um, but Rasulullah clarified this for us, that what was there was only a masjid. It was only ever a masjid. The Temple of Solomon, the Temple of Herod, whatever you want to call them, they were masajid. Um, so Abu Dhar asked, Ya Rasulullah, which masjid was built first on the surface of the earth? And Rasulullah replied, uh, Al Masjid al Haram. So that's in Mecca. And then Abu Dhar said, Which one was built next? And he, re and he وسلم, replied, The Masjid of Al Aqsa in Jerusalem. And then he asked, What was the period of, diff of uh, construction between the two? What, how far apart are they? And he said, 40 years. So all the people talking about a third temple now, building a third, quote unquote, third temple, it would actually be, you know, right now, Masjid al Aqsa is the fourth temple. Because the temple meaning a place where Allah is worshipped. So you have the first one built by Ishaq, alayhi salam. The first one is built by Ishaq, the son of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, after Ibrahim, or after Ismail separates. Does this make sense? Ismail is in Mecca, Ishaq is in Jerusalem, and they build two masjids 40 years apart. That's the essential beginning of the story. When the Israelites come back after the Exodus, then they rebuild what's called the Temple of, of uh, Solomon. And this is what it would have looked like, allegedly, at the time of Suleiman alayhi salam. They uh, did sacrifices here. They had a different sharia. It makes sense. Uh, and there's a Jewish movement to rebuild this temple on the land of what is now Masjid al-Aqsa. But we believe their sharia has been abrogated. So that's the issue. Um, now, this is what it would look like if you're looking at a rough timeline between you know, 2000 BC and 600 CE of Ibrahim alayhi salam having two lines of children. Most of the prophets, of the number of them, would be in what is known as Bani Israel, which is the bottom here. So we'll start with Ishaq alayhi salam, and then, Bani, and then Yaqub, who is Israel. His lineage is Bani Israel. So Israel is named after him. And then Yusuf alayhi salam, and then at this point, this whole family moves to Egypt. They're in Egypt until Musa alayhi salam and Harun. They return 
and then they establish what is called the Kingdom of Israel. It only existed for a couple hundred years. They say, you know, the politicians now will bring this as a point of contention. You know, this, it doesn't really matter to us of what you want to call it. Um, before this, it was called Canaan, you know. It was called Israel because it's named after Bani Israel. But we know that their Sharia has been abrogated by our Sharia. Then there's Dawood and Suleiman, and then the minor prophets, meaning like Ilyas alayhi salam, the uh, Kifal alayhi salam, um, many of those minor prophets uh, in that period. And then Zakariya, Yahya, and Isa alayhi salam are mentioned in the Quran, and they're uh, amazing prophets that lived at the time of the Roman occupation of Palestine uh, around 2000 years ago. It lasted, I think, until the second century. Um, and then after that, there is a break. During that break, there's no more prophets from Bani Israel. Uh, and the, the final prophet will come back from this line of Ismail. So the Israeli line has, begun, has stopped and uh, the Ismaili line has, has uh, resumed. And that is our prophet وسلم, who was sent to all mankind. These prophets on the, on the uh, lower part were sent to their communities. They were sent to their nation. So I just like to clarify that Islam starts with Adam alayhi salam. Islam is not a new religion. Islam goes back to the beginning of creation. All of the prophets sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were upon Tawheed, which is pure monotheism. There were no idols or images. And history supports this view. A careful reading of history of ancient Judaism and Christianity leads to you believing this as well. Um, Christianity as we know it is a corrupted religion with polytheism. Um, with a, trini a triune, three gods in one uh, view. The earliest Christians, which is the church in Jerusalem, the Nazarenes and the Ebionites, three groups that you can look up, were, I think, clearly upon Tawheed. They did not believe in like a divine Jesus or anything like that, but it corrupted very quickly, and they didn't leave behind a lot of writings. We simply know about them because they were refuted by other groups. Um, even later movements, like even the Jehovah's Witnesses who you might have met, they're slightly close to, like, they're challenging the Trinity a little bit. They're, you know, slightly closer to us, even though we would consider it still, it's not Tawheed, really. Um, and the Arians and Nestorians were movements in the 3rd century and the 5th century um, that really challenged some of the fundamental conceptions of the Trinity, which is why Christians constantly had to have these councils to determine what they actually believed. Similarly, Judaism as we know it today was not called Judaism until the Roman occupation. So they didn't really refer to themselves as Jews because Judah was only one of the 12 tribes. They didn't refer to themselves as Jews, they referred to themselves as Bani Israel, which is why Isa salam, doesn't say Ya Yuhal Yahud in the Quran. He says Ya Bani Israel. The Yahud is a, is a term that they gave themselves after and it was actually a negative term by the Romans also to refer to them as uh, Yahud. They also introduced, you know, re they rejected the prophets first of all. That's a big issue. They rejected Isa as a prophet. Uh, they introduced shirk, specifically angel worship, as well as some other things, uh, more subtly than Christianity, but it's definitely there. I've talked to Jews about this and they, they basically admit that they consider, you know, like some angels to be like small gods. Judaism also became an ethno-religion. So now they don't consider you Jewish unless you're born Jewish. Uh, like your mother has to be from the line uh, of Jews to be considered Jewish. And so if you look at history, what's called Second Temple Judaism, which is Judaism of the time of Isa, salam, we could simply call this Islam of Bini Israel during the time of Isa, salam. Historically, that's what it is. Because Islam didn't change until they started rejecting the prophets. It, it, Judaism wasn't invented until after they started rejecting the prophets. So what was happening while all these Israelite prophets were being sent in Arabia? What was happening in Arabia? Uh, the kingdom of Sheba, or the kingdom of Seba, is a great example mentioned in the Quran that, uh, and you shall read the story in Surah Naman, about... Suleiman alayhi the, the bird comes to him with the news of a, of a queen and her people worshiping the sun, and he threatens her, and she is invited to visit him. Uh, and this is in Yemen. This area is in Yemen. And uh, 
and these um, ruins are allegedly from that civilization. Um, so this would be at the time of Suleiman alayhi salam, roughly 3,000 years ago. So if you zoom out and look at the Arabian Peninsula as a, a, ge a ge geographical place, if you look at this and see, just look at it for a second, and you realize it's in the center of the world. So really the old world where most humans would have been, the vast majority of humans would have been on this side of the earth, not in the, the Americas. The Arabian Peninsula is right in the middle of Europe, Asia, and Africa. It's like hanging off that it, this is the middle. You'll also notice it has highly rugged terrain. It has a very hot climate, and it's naturally protect, protected from invaders. So if you look at Alexander the Great's conquest, for example, he completely avoids Arabia. He goes to Egypt and then just passes it because it's just too hard to bring an army in from the north. And the only person to really try to invade Arabia with a foreign army is the story that Yusuf mentioned last time, which is the story of Abraha. Uh, Abraha from Ethiopia tried to attack Mecca with the elephants and a foreign army. We'll get more to that part of history uh, towards the end of the presentation. But it's, it's essentially protected from outside force. And even the colonists of you know, the colonial era, era, they didn't really get Arabia. Like they wanted to, like they occupied Egypt, like Napoleon conquered Egypt, all of North Africa, they got that. Um, all of like the Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Iraq area, of course, the, the colonists did that. But they never really penetrated into Arabia. In fact, the Portuguese tried to attack Mecca one time, and the Hujaj were, it was Hajj time, the Hujaj were standing at the coast, and they all got their swords, and they were ready to fight the, the Portuguese, and they never succeeded. Um, and this is nestled also between the biggest world powers of the time in the 6th century. Right above uh, the Arabian Peninsula is what was Mesopotamia, which at that time had transformed into the Persian and the Roman empires. So, so the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire, respectively. And it's a highly strategic place. If you look, there's two oceans on either side. There's the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. The Arabs will call it the Arabian Gulf, by the way. And both of them have choke points. And like 80% of the world's oil goes through one of these choke points. The other one is currently choked because of the war and the Yemenis are, have captured a, sh a ship in the Red Sea. And it has, that's one of the reasons for inflation right now is because the ships that are going from Europe to India or Europe to Asia have to go around the tip of Africa now. They cannot go through the Red Sea safely through the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal wasn't there back then. The Suez Canal is a recent invention, but still uh, the maritime spice trade did go up the Red Sea. So uh, the outside powers, as I mentioned, uh, what you see on the right here is the Sassanid Empire and the Byzantine Empire on the left. At this point, they've been fighting each other for about a thousand years, pretty intensely. Um, and there's a war happening at the time of the Prophet they were in them which Surat Rum mentions. Um, I kind of glossed over that in this presentation, but there is um, an ongoing conflict between them during the life of the, of the Prophet and the Sahaba. There's a third external power, which is Abyssinia, which is not as aggressive, um, but, and it's, it's more closely related to the Romans, and it's down here, and you really have to go through water to get there. Um, but it will come up in the Sira multiple times for multiple reasons. Um, that's one of the first places that the Sahabas uh, actually flee to for, for refuge. The major regions of Arabia, what you really need to know is the word Hijaz. Hijaz is this red area, basically, you know, from Jordan down past Mecca, and this is a very mountainous area. So if you go here, there's actually some areas in here that are grassy and mountainous because of the rain getting caught uh, with the wind. Um, and this is where the Prophet them is from. Mecca is right in the middle here, right about there by the A. Um, and Medina is in Hijaz as well. Nejd is this big, um, this big flat area. And now they will, like this is where Riyadh is today, is in Nejd. Um, Bahrain was not a country back then. Bahrain was this 
where Qatar is in this coastal area. Bahrain, the country then took the name. And then Iraq and Asham, these are uh, areas that would have spoken Arabic all the way up to Damascus area, would have been speaking Arabic. Yemen is this area, it's uh, not exactly the same shape as modern day Yemen. Hadramaut is like a different region. Um, now Hadramaut is part of Yemen. Oman, it was called Oman back then. And these are the major, and this Al-Urud area is mostly empty. So there's not a lot of stuff happening uh, right there. So most of the interesting stuff in Arabia is happening in Yemen and Hijaz uh, overall. That's kind of the main regions you need to know about. The major distinctions of the Arabs, and I'll mention two. Uh, the first is the genetic distinction, and this is basically from the south and from the north. So the Qahtani Arabs, uh, basically from the south, originally from Yemen, these are the original Arabs. Um, and then the Adnanis are from Ismail salam. And these are from the north. Uh, and, and Yusuf already mentioned both of these groups, so I won't get too deep into it, but they intermixed a lot. And also, they're not like in clearly in one region or the other. Like in Medina, they're Qahtani. In Mecca, they are Adnani. There's also class distinctions of the Bedou, so the Bedouins, also called Al Arab, so like Arabs but plural. It's used negatively in the Quran to refer to the Bedouins who were uh, very rough with the Prophet of Allah. They were some them. Um, and this is this is a different culture. This is where the Arabic culture really comes from is the nomadic lifestyle, where they wouldn't stay in one place necessarily. And then there is the Khabar, which are the city dwellers. And they still, if, if you talk to a Saudi Arabian, uh, they will still have this distinction between people today. Even though now most of the Bedouins are settled, you know, working in jobs and things, um, you know, they still have this class, almost like racism against each other. But, you know, it's like this class distinction from a long time ago of there's the Hadar and the Badu. So this, I don't have enough time to go into too much detail about the Arab tribes. I'll try to talk about some of the major ones. But this will help you every time Yusuf brings up a tribe, you can maybe know where they're from and how they're positioned and what their alliances are. Like, for example, there's a, there's a rivalry between Khuza'a and Quraysh. Why? Because Khuza'a used to control the Kaaba and then Quraysh got it back. Uh, and then Khuza'a, before the Quraysh could take it back, by the way, they, they buried Zamzam. Like, if, if we can't have it, nobody can have it. And then uh, it was um, the Prophet's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who actually rediscovered uh, where the, um, the Zamzam well was. And what, I think Yusuf will still talk about this um, in the early life of the Prophet. So the first tribe you need to know is Quraysh. That is the tribe of the Prophet Does anyone know what Quraysh means linguistically? No, it, it's a nickname. Like there's theories about it. It means little shark, literally. That's the literal linguistic meaning, like a little biter. So the theory is that Fihr, who when he was a boy, who's an ancestor of the Prophet them used to bite people. And so they nicknamed him Quraysh and it just caught on. That's one of the theories. There's a lot of stuff like that in, in uh, in the Sira literature and in Hadith, like Abu Huraira. What does Huraira mean? He's the number one narrator of Hadith, and his name, his nickname is Father of the Kitten, because he used to have little cats with him. So these nicknames caught on, they're very common. Um, the next tribe you need to know is Thaqif. Thaqif is in Taif, which is, um, it's west of Mecca. It's a very nice place. It has cooler weather. It's uphill. Um, they very, you know, violently rejected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they did also, you know, become Muslim before his death. Uh, and you know, Brother Yusuf will get to that story, inshallah. Um, and you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam thought that he might be able to immigrate there because they're so closely related to Quraysh. Um, thirdly, you need to know about Aus and Khazraj. These are two Qahtani tribes from Medina. Uh, these are the Ansar. These people become the Ansar. Um, and before Islam, they absolutely hated each other. They were cousins. Uh, they both come from Khazraj, by the way. It's Aus and Khazraj. And they had giant wars before Islam, which killed all the old people. So all the old chieftains were actually dead at the time of the Hijrah. So they didn't have a lot of this elderly baggage to accept Islam. 
Um, so other names, Ghatafan. Um, this was this is this big tribe right here. Ghatafan uh, fought against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Quraysh, with the Yahud in the Battle of Ahzab. They're a giant tribe. Um, Banu Ghassan, right up here, I'll, I'll skip up here. Banu Ghassan is a buffer state between Rome and Arabia. So if you look at history, there are certain countries that exist only to prevent other countries from invading other countries. So for example, uh, like Senegal and Gambia. <laughs> uh, for example, Belgium. Belgium in, in Europe was basically created to prevent Germany from constantly invading France because they just couldn't stop themselves. Um, Benu Ghassan prevents the Arab tribes from raiding, you know, Rome. And the Romans would give them money, they would give them money sometimes, you know. It was, it was a mutually beneficial arrangement. Uh, Ghassan, they thought, you know, there's a hadith where, the, where Omar radiallahu an actually thinks that they just attacked us because there was some news happening. He's like, did Benu Ghassan finally attack? Is that what we're all gathered about? They thought, you know, this, we're getting too big, they're getting too big, they're going to fight. And um, they converted to Islam quite easily, actually. So uh, they're, towards the end of the seerah, we'll talk more about Banu Ghassan. And the equivalent of Banu Ghassan on the Persian side is Banu Lakham. There's some Sahaba from this tribe. I looked up, if you just type in Lakham in Sunnah.com, there's a couple, uh, there's one narrator from this tribe. Also the Lakhmid dynasty, you can call them. They're like the buffer state with the Persians. Um, Beni Taglib is really the farthest north tribe. The Prophet them, I've heard that he has some kind of relations with every tribe on the Arabian Peninsula, with the exception of Beni Taglib. Beni Taglib is like really like a Syrian Roman. Um, they're not super Arab. They were probably speaking another language actually, maybe Syriania or Aramaic. And they're all the way up like past Damascus. They're, this is actually too south for them. Um, and then, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi them. he has relations to many of these tribes, if not all of them, through marriage or maternal cousins or his own cousins. You know, everybody on this whole peninsula is related. Uh, Beni Tamim is another big tribe. Actually, their accent has, you know, the Quraysh actually, instead of Mu'minun, they would say Mu'minun. So many of us actually recite the Quran according to the to the um, accent of Bini Tamim now. Um, Warsh will they'll say Muminun, Bini Tamim will say Mu'minun, they'll have the Hamza. Uh, another tribe I'll mention is Binu Sa'ad, Binu Sa'ad ibn Bakr to be specific. And this is the tribe of Hadima al Sa'adiya, who will come up in the beginning of the Seerah and is the wet nurse of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quraysh used to send their boys to go live in the desert, to avoid illness, and to also become more rugged, tough, and learn the Bedouin Arabic, which was better. The Bedouin Arabic, by the way, is better than the city Arabic, because city Arabic has a lot of people traveling in and out. They simplify their language. This happens everywhere. The more isolated the language is, and the more ancient it is, the more complex it is. Um, and that was the, the case with the Bedouins. Even to today, they will have, they, they will lack some areas of education, right? They won't know how everything works like a city person. They might not know how to be a merchant as well as a city person, but they will have these other skills, like basically country living skills plus language uh, that the city people won't have. Uh, Abu Dhar, Benu Ghifar uh, is a very interesting tribe. They, their profession was robbing people on the highways. So they were a raiding tribe, and Abu Dhar al Ghifari is from them. And when they tried to beat him up at the Kaaba, somebody said, "Oh, he's from Banu Ghifar," and everybody backed off because they know if you if you beat up that guy, the whole tribe's going to come after you now. And what you really realize is that the tribal connections of Arabia is what protected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, by the grace of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, that they weren't willing to harm him because of the tribal ramifications. So this actually helped Islam in the beginning. And then Beni Kelb, I'll mention them just as an aside. They were the tribe that sold Salman al-Farsi into slavery. Um, and they're in the north here. Um, they're also a very prominent tribe. There's lots of people with the name Kelbi and things. It means dog, literally. Um, so a funny story there, you know, uh, Imam Ali radiallahu anh, he got married again several times after Fatima alayhi salam. 
radiallahu anha had died. So one of his wives had a daughter, and Ali used to take the daughter um, to the masjid with him. And so the, the uncles would ask this daughter, where are you from, or, or who are your maternal uncles? And she would respond, woof, woof. And she meant Beni Kelb, <laughs> which means the tribe of the dog. So they did have a, a lot of humor uh, in ancient Arabia. When you look at the religious landscape of what Arabia was doing religiously before Islam, it was basically all idol worship and paganism. So this was, you know, from top to bottom, there was idol worship and paganism. Everything else is sprinkled a little bit. I mean, you get a little bit of everything anywhere you go, but it's basically idol worship to the point where people don't really know a lot about Judaism or Christianity. They, uh, the Quraysh asked the Jews, what should we ask the prophet? You know, they didn't have knowledge of these stories. And so I'll mention Christianity. Christianity is mostly located in two parts in Arabia, and that is Ben Ghassan in the north, and then uh, what, is, uh, what is Najran in the south. So what is Himyar, which is this coastal area of Yemen, um, is where uh, the Christians are. And the Christians of Najran, which is right here on the coast, actually send a delegation to the Prophet them, and they most of Surah Ta'adi Imran is in response to them. So if you want to read the conversation between them and the Prophet them, he's just reciting Surah Ta'adi Imran. Allah is revealing it to him during that meeting. Uh, there's Judaism also, which there's many theories about how it got there. Uh, likely there's two ways. One of them is that uh, after the Roman occupation ended in uh, what is now Palestine, they migrated south to Arabia and some of them had knowledge of the signs of the, of the next prophet. And so they established themselves in Yemen, as well as Khaybar and Medina. And these are the main places where you find the Jewish tribes. The other theory is that, we'll get to this, there was a king in Hemyar who actually converted to Judaism. So there were potentially Arab Jewish converts, and there were some Jewish converts in uh, Medina as well. Thirdly, I'll mention Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism, if Islam had never come, we might still have Zoroastrianism. Islam basically completely destroyed it. Zoroastrianism was the, the state religion of what is now Iran in Persia, and it centered around fire worship, and they had two gods, and these two gods were like opposites of each other. So they were basically pagans, um, you know, but they had their, it was a national religion, and it's basically completely dead. Um, there are small communities of it in India. Actually, my mother-in-law went to a, what they call a Parsi school, which is a Zoroastrian school. It's a very small community in India, and then there's some of it in Iran. Um, they would have had, basically, Persia had some bases in Arabia, mostly along the coast here, um, and then also in Yemen. So in Yemen, Yemen was a bit of a fighting area between the Aksum Empire and the Persians. There were some political games happening down here. And then there is, I'll also mention Manichaeism. And this is a religion that's very dead now. Um, St. Augustine, the Christian, actually was originally a Manichaean. And this is, there was a prophet, uh, well, we don't believe he's a prophet. There's a guy named Mani who claimed to be a prophet. And he kind of made this um, hodgepodge religion, like combining Buddhism with Christianity. They were vegetarians um, and they worshiped demons sometimes. So it was very strange, um, but it was around um, back then. And th that would have been in the very north here. Um, so I, I put down at the bottom the refutation of the hodgepodge theory. I don't know if I'll have time to get into, okay, I'll do it. But um, the hodgepodge theory is like the best the academics have right now. To basically say that Islam arose because a very educated man named Muhammad them, studied for years in Syria and he learned multiple languages and he, he studied with Jewish sages and Christians and he combined all this information and he made Islam. And if you just look at the history, you realize how ridiculous this theory is. That essentially it's claiming that Islam is just a power play. Now, Rasulullah lived in a mud house, first of all. There was no power play happening in, during his entire life. As well, why is there no mention of any Zoroastrian stories or prophets in the Quran, if this is true? 
if he's just inventing the Quran and adding stories from other cultures, why is the prophet Manny not mentioned? Uh, which we don't believe is a prophet, by the way. Why is Zoroaster not mentioned? And then why also are there so many differences between Christianity and Judaism? The Quran is constantly correcting the biblical narrative. It's literally constant. In every story, there is some correction of what the Bible is saying or how people could misread the Bible. For example, that God rested on the seventh day. This is refuted in the Quran that Allah, it says Allah created the earth in, in six days and then he doesn't ever get fatigued. And what could that be other than just a refutation of the Bible? So the hodgepodge theory, I think it's the best they got and it's still extremely bad. The introduction of idolatry, which uh, Yusuf already mentioned the story that Abu Hurairah mentioned the Prophet uh, said, I saw Amr uh, ibn Amr ibn Luhay al-Khuza'i, Khuza'i, the rival tribe of, of Quraysh, dragging his intestines in the hellfire. He introduced the custom of releasing animals on behalf of false gods. In another narration, the Prophet وسلم, said, he was the first to change the religion of Ismail and set up idols. The what what likely happened is that there that this um, this man Amr Amr ibn Luhay introduced the god Hubal, the idol Hubal, from Syria into Mecca, specifically Mecca. Now there were likely ancient idolaters before that, like already before him there was idolatry in the rest of Arabia. And this is confirmed by the Quran because in Seba, in the kingdom of Seba, they weren't monotheist, right? They weren't necessarily visiting the Kaaba. They were worshiping the sun. So my personal theory is that the religion of Ismail were the people of that visited the Kaaba yearly. These were the people who did Hajj. And these people rejected idolatry throughout history. Eventually, this man introduced idols which corrupted this group. This doesn't mean there weren't other idols around the edges of Arabia. So this is my personal theory. You can take it or leave it. Also, Hubal is likely Baal, which is a, uh, an idol that there is a fertility idol that they worshipped uh, in Syria. And it's mentioned in the Quran as well. And you, you might be wondering, what is so evil about idolatry? They're just worshiping statues. What, what could be so evil about that? This is something that's offensive to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes this with Jahannam. So this is not something that's minor. Oh, you know, I'm just worshiping this picture or, you know, I'm venerating this artwork or something. This is, you know, what's wrong with this? What idolatry leads to is a lack, complete lack of ethics in the way that you live your life. And this is very apparent if you look at you know, the ancient Greek society or even the ancient Arabian society, which is very close um, to how they acted. It made them very superstitious. Um, they did things like Burning Man. So they would leave the city all at once and they would go party in the desert for a week. You know, who knows what drugs are going on out there. And every pagan society that we know of has some sort of human sacrifice. And they did this. The, we know the Arabians did this. They buried their daughters if they were embarrassed to have a daughter, especially if she was the firstborn. So they'd be embarrassed to have her, they let her grow up a little bit, and then they would bury her alive. So this is, um, this is what idolatry leads to, is these things. You know, also fahisha and other sins, you know, that were quite common among the, um, you know, many, of who, who, many people who became Sahaba actually were engaged in these things, and they repented and Allah accepted them. And you know, when the Prophet entered Mecca on the day of the Fetch, there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. So once the first idol was introduced, I imagine all the other tribes brought their idol and they all came to Mecca to venerate their idol. And the Prophet destroyed them. He struck them with a stick uh, and he said, truth has come and falsehood would neither start nor will it reappear. This is what Mecca looked like, likely at the time of the Prophet them. You'll see that the mountains are much deeper than what we have now, and that's because everything builds up over time. So actually, you can see Mecca is very, very protected, and it's all centered around the Kaaba. It's basically even in every direction. Um, and this is the house of Khadija radiallahu anh. This is a guess based on the location of the mountain. So the people who rendered this together, they did a really good job. This is a video on YouTube if you just search Mecca at the time of the Prophet. 
you'll see this and they'll point out more locations of different Sahaba's houses. Also like where the red light district was, where the, the sheep market was, where all these different things were, where the roads in were, because you entered for Hajj like at a certain place. Um, now there's just roads and tunnels that go in, uh, but this is what it looks like. Also, you'll notice no, no buildings over two stories back then. It was too hard to build that high. And now we have you know the tallest clock tower in the world in Mecca. And their trade routes in Mecca, I mean, you have to understand, Mecca was very rich. I mean, it was a very, very wealthy place by and large. There were very wealthy people there. That doesn't mean there weren't poor people. Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. This, they were secure in their trading caravan in the winter and in the summer. And this, they did the winter one. Uh, they went to Yemen in the summer. Uh, I mean, sorry, Syria in the summer, Yemen in the winter. And that's likely for just weather reasons. Um, but you can see this is the ancient trade routes. So there's the maritime trade route here which would have been boats going to India uh, and China and coming through here. Um, and this is the land routes. And Mecca is right along uh, where Medina is connected here uh, between Medina and Najwa. So it was a big deal. Um, and what were they selling mostly? What made the Arabians super rich? It was a substance called luban. And this is frankincense. Um, frankincense is only grown in the Arabian Peninsula. It's very hard to grow outside of it. There might be some in Africa, by the way, but um, this is a resin from a tree. And you have to understand, ancient society was extremely smelly. So if you lived in Rome, you could smell it. It was all the time. There, the sewage systems were not covered, basically. That's, and you can imagine how bad that can get. So whenever there was a ceremony or a gathering of people, they would burn lots of incense. And one of the best ones was frankincense. Uh, and this is actually an ancient uh, Yemeni incense burner that's carved with the old South Arabian alphabet because um, you know, this stuff was cheap over in Arabia, but it made them extremely rich by selling it to the Romans and the Persians. Um, so it was also considered at times more valuable than gold, like the weight of it more valuable than gold. Uh, especially around the time of Isa Alayhi Salaam, there was a lot of Roman uh, purchasing of, of frankincense. There's also this story mentioned in the Quran of the uh, Sadd Ma'rib, which is the Ma'rib Dam. And this is in Saba, so in southern Arabia, in 500 CE, so the century before the Prophet. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his prophethood comes at the end of the 6th century. This is the beginning of the 6th century. And this was an ancient engineering wonder that is alluded to in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with orchards on both sides, and they were told to eat, and you know they had a very wealthy and um, prosperous life there because of this dam with all the irrigation it provided. By the way, this dam has been rebuilt. It, it exists now. Uh, in Yemen, um, and you can look it up. It's it's not this exact structure here. This is the ancient structure, the one that exploded. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them for their disobedience and um, flooded the area. And also it just became just a, a, a desert after that. So the, the consequent failure of the irrigation system provoked a migration of up to 50,000 people from Yemen to other parts of the Arabian Peninsula. So this is where a lot of the Qahdani tribes that were in Medina might have come from this disaster. So Aus and Khazraj might have come directly from this uh, disaster in Seba. And this, I wish I could spend more time. Yes. Sorry. The picture before, before this, that, 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 yeah. What was the written on the buildings? This writing? Yeah, the, this is the South Arabian alphabet. This was in Yemen. They, they call it South Arabian alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, our guest alphabet. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's the same like uh, Abraham Hashurus. Uh, oh, okay, mashallah. The same. That's interesting. It says, yeah. what's the name? What does it say? What's the name? It means like a uh, site. Interesting. Yeah. Wow, mashallah. That's amazing. So I wish I could mention more about the Hemurite kingdom. I put a link. I'll, I'll drop this link for everybody. There's a great video on them. Uh, they're mentioned in the Quran where the, the Jewish king 
the king that converted to Judaism and in uh, in Hemyar or Yemen, he um, persecuted the Christians, which in this case are called believers in the Quran. And this was about a hundred years before the Prophet was in them. He burned them alive. Um, whether or not these Christians strictly believed in Tawheed, I mean Allah Hurrah, um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to them as believers. Um, and this uh, this Kings and Generals video, which is a great channel if you guys are into history, um, it has a great summary of the Hemurite kingdom, as well as some of the economics that I've already discussed. So the Arabic language, um, this is from a book called Arabs, A 3,000-Year History of Peoples, Tribes, and Empires by an English historian. He's not Muslim, but he's very kind to Muslims and understands. So his book, I really highly recommend it. Uh, there's two passages from here I'd like to mention. He says, a language had to form that could be understood by speakers of different North Arabian dialects, which is the South Arabians spoke another group of languages, distantly related but incomprehensible to the Northerners. The distance was something like that between German and Italian. Later, at some time well before the fifth century, and possibly in the central peninsula, a quote, high form of a unified Northern language also took shape. This, the Arabiya, was not everyday speech, but a quote, mystical tongue used for oracle giving and recitation of poetry. Those who could command this special tongue above all the sha'ir, later on a poet, but in its oldest sense, probably more like a seer or a shaman, could attract followers. In time of raids, the sha'ir also played the role of Whitman's poet, the most deadly force of the war. He can make every word he speaks draw blood. What he's trying to say here is that the way people spoke day to day across the entire Arabian Peninsula differed quite a lot. Um, and there were different accents. And still today, you can hear this if you just listen to somebody from Yemen uh, or somebody from the Northern Arabia. You can still hear this. Um, but basically, a language formed that there was a high formal Arabic that came around in the fifth century. And this is the Arabic of the Quran. The Quran comes at this time when this Arabic has already been established. And this is the Arabic of the poets. Um, and not everyone spoke like this in this high Arabic on a day to day basis. Um, he also says it's very interesting. What is more certain is that Arabic has preserved features that are older than those of any other Semitic language, and that some of these features may have branched off the Semitic root very early on, perhaps as early as 4,000 to 500 uh, before uh, uh, BCE. Then again, perhaps the Semitic root is in fact not the rootstock, but it itself belongs to a wider Afro-Asiatic family. What he's trying to say here is that Arabic is basically, he's basically saying Arabic could be the oldest language in the world. Um, because the way linguistics works, when they try to go back in language, they look at certain features that are not added, they're just taken away. And Hebrew, for example, if you learn sarf with Arabic, you'll know this. There's 15 verb forms. So you learn these like scales of how to conjugate a verb. An example, for example, Hebrew only has 10. So it goes down from 15 to 10. So the more complex one is the older one. And so this is how they, they calculate this. And Arabic has more of this than any other Semitic language. And so how was this practiced? Uh, Arabic poetry was very popular. This was the media uh, back then. This is what people listened to. This is what they recited at night. Many of the Sahaba had mentioned, had memorized thousands of lines. You wonder why could people memorize the Quran very fast? And that's because they had memorized poetry all the time. This was super common. And there's a great publication that just came out, which is a translation of what's called the Mu'allaqat, which the Arabs didn't have a book. They had poems. And the Mu'allaqat were seven poems that were hanging on the Kaaba because they were so good. The Arabs liked them so much, they wrote them down and they hung them on the Kaaba in, in long scrolls. And here I mentioned some... A lot of this is about, you know, talking about camels and your tribe and war and how awesome we are. Um, and it's interesting to see. It's not, you know, uh, it's not amazing, but, you know, it, it was very popular back then. A lot of it sounds like rap music. You know, they're just bragging about themselves. Um, but the Mu'allaqat has been translated and you can download it for free and kind of read all of them in English from the uh, Ithra Museum here. So I encourage you all to check that out.
I asked, I have a friend that teaches Arabic poetry and I asked him if he wanted me to mention any lines. And he mentioned these lines by Amr ibn Kulthum, uh, who said in his Muallaqat, don't let anyone act arrogantly towards us or ignorantly towards us, for we will respond with an ignorance greater than that of the ignorant. So basically, if you act bad towards us, we're going to act worse towards you. He also said, oppressors seeking wrongdoing, and we did not wrong them, but we will start with those who oppress us. So, you know, basically anyone we don't like, we're going to, you know, attack you. And then when the infant among us is weaned, even the mighty bow down to him in prostration. So even our babies are stronger than you, basically. And then he contrasts this, my friend, he contrasts this with Rasulullah who said, God has revealed to me that you should be humble. You should not oppress one another and no one boasts over another. So Alhamdulillah who brought us out of the darkness of arrogance and ignorance and purified us with our master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with, with the Mu'allaqat, you'll get an idea of how the Arabs thought. They were very focused on the tribe, very focused on pride, winning every war, you know, being very rich, etc. Brother Yusuf already mentioned the story, and that's the trends of monotheism that were happening in Arabia. And you can't point, really, that there's a giant trend happening. But there are people, individual people, who are rejecting the idols out of ethical concerns. Um, the one I like to mention is Zayd ibn Amr. His son became Muslim. So Sayyid ibn Zayd. Zayd ibn Amr died too early. Um, and he didn't, he refused to convert to Christianity or Judaism. And he told them that this isn't the religion of Ibrahim and you know it. So the people of, uh, of Quraysh, they knew they were from Ibrahim and they knew that Christianity and Judaism was not their religion. And this is uh, an ayah mentioning um, Millat Ibrahim, and this is the way of Ibrahim, Hanifan. So uh, Hanifan was basically a word for a monotheist. This is what Mecca looks like today. Um, I didn't include any pictures of Medina, but most people go, you know, uh, to both when they visit. Inshallah, I encourage you all to visit. It's actually quite easy to visit Mecca. Um, and when you learn the seerah, this will give you an anchor of what to see when you're there. Otherwise, you'll kind of be wandering around. What is this? Why is that there? You know, uh, there's people there who are reading the du'a books, you know, while they're doing tawaf because, you know, they didn't memorize it before they got there. Um, so really, the seerah is the best prep for visiting Mecca and Medina. And you'll see all the buildings have risen above the mountains now. And there's actually a, a saying of the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba that says that this will happen towards the end of time. Um, this, this picture is actually taken from the clock tower, which is enormous. Um, but the whole city is growing amazingly, and you can see it. Basically, the entire picture I showed you earlier is encompassed by the masjid now. This masjid can fit 3 million people at max capacity. And there's probably 20 to 30,000 people doing tawaf at any given time, which is amazing. So I highly encourage you all to go. If you have questions about it, I can give you links to um, some travel agencies that make the whole process very easy, inshallah. So all of this really is a, you know, a quick dive through history, but ultimately this is about love for the Prophet This is about love for where he came from. And Anas ibn Malik reported that the Messenger of Allah said, none of you have faith until I am more beloved to him than his children, his father, and all of the people. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim. And another hadith I'll mention, Anta ma'a man ahbabt, that you will be with those who you love. And this is in reference to the day of judgment, that whoever you love the most, you're going to be resurrected near them. So inshallah, may Allah make us the lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, and let us be with him in the hereafter, inshallah. Uh, we'll go ahead and do adhan. Do other, and then we'll we'll do questions after that, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.
نعم 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 